thanks so much. Um, uh, yeah, it's an absolute privilege to to kickstart the Unlocking Nature series. Yeah, I'm really excited to share a little bit of my passion and uh, the work that I've done, you know, in the conservation sphere. Tonight, I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, on a topic that's not really fully related to my my conservation work that I've been engaged in over the last 15 years. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure working with the Birds of Prey program here at the Endangered Wildlife Trust and it's, uh, as I say, I've committed a big part of my life to conserving these really remarkable creatures that are also amongst the most threatened birds or groups of animals on the planet. So um, it's, it's it, yeah, as I say, it, it, I can't say anything else, but it's it's been a privilege. And uh, we, I work with the most incredible people in the most fantastic landscapes. And yeah, it's been such a journey. And, and, and I, I, I see myself working in this kind of sphere for the rest of my life. Um, so today I was tasked to, to talk about um, effectively what makes a raptor a raptor. And I must admit that I've engaged in various con conversations with, um, with colleagues and friends and partners um, about the definition of, you know, what makes a raptor a raptor. And I went down a wormhole and I urge you all to, to actually, if you really want to understand the, the, the definition of raptors better, is to read a short communication put together by Makira et al um, on, on the Journal of Raptor Research, in the Journal of Raptor Research. And he really unpacks this, the, the interesting evolution and classification of raptors. But I think, you know, to avoid that and, and to, to stick to the context of, of, of ornithology and biology, I think, you know, the, the, the basic um, understanding and definition of raptors refers to a bird of prey. And these birds are are characterized by their sharp talons, of course, and their hooked beaks, which they use to capture and kill, and, and in the case of vultures, also to con consume their prey. Um, and so they're essentially a carnivorous, um, or a lot largely con carnivorous species, um, and often at the top of the food chain, they're apex predators. And these include species like your eagles, your hawks, your falcons, and your owls, and of course, your, your incredible vultures. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a pretty, um, interesting thing or process developing this this uh, presentation because there's so much to talk about raptors and you know the the adaptations for me are what really trigger my my interest and um, what I try to design this presentation is to really to to unpack these adaptations that allow allow them to live this carnivorous and raptorial lifestyle and this involves these adaptations such as the remarkable beaks and their, their feet and talons. Of course, we, we think of raptors, we think of, of feet and big talons. Um, and then, of course, their, their, their vision, which is, which is second to none. Um, I also would love to touch on their body sizes because they have a, a extraordinary diversity in body sizes that have allowed them to fill every ecological niche out there. And then, of course, this is coupled or, or, or you know, coupled with their, their feathers and their flight. Um, they have extraordinary flight, flight capabilities. And this all links to how they catch their food and how they forage and, and eat. Um, so yeah, I'll be, I'll be focusing a lot on their adaptations. And then of course, how this links to, as I mentioned, their foraging and their diet. And this has enabled them to take on the world. Um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit more in the context of the raptors that I'm used to in, in Africa, but it really has allowed them to move into landscapes and fill all these eco ecological niches that, um, that, that are really extraordinary from, a, from an ecological perspective. So to kickstart things off, um, raptor vision is, of course, a fascinating thing. And um, their vision and their visual capabilities are, are highly advanced. And of course, this allows them to excel in hunting and in capturing their prey. Um, what is really unique to them is they have this binocular vision. And this allows them to perceive depth well and judge distances accurately. And it's a crucial part for pinpointing, pinpointing and targeting their prey, especially when they're in flight. You can imagine the, the kind of coordination it takes to, to catch prey that's on the move and often trying to escape for their lives. Um, so yeah, they have really incredible adaptations that have enabled them to take on the daytime um, role of, of a predator, but also the nocturnal role of a predator. And I think it's really remarkable how we see them filling, as I keep on saying, all these ecological niches. So they, the full spectrum of daylight and nighttime, they, they are incredible hunters. 
Um, and it's, it's really cool to have a look at how these species have evolved to develop different visual acuity and, and, and capabilities. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the more interesting things is how you have this difference between predators and your scavengers. So, you know, scavengers are spending a lot of time looking for food on the ground, and obviously their food isn't trying to run away from them. So they have to develop eyesight that enables them to fly and cover big distances, but also to pick up very small prey items in a big landscape. So they have eyesight that's specifically developed um, to enlarge their field of view. And you can imagine that like your, your eye has a certain, um, a certain amount of visual field that you can see, but vultures will see pretty much everything in focus. So they can pick up a really tiny prey item in the landscape. And um, this is a really fascinating thing for me. And then, and then of course, for your, for your predators, you, you usually have these larger eyes to their body mass and really incredible binocular vision. They obviously interacting with the landscape and they're dodging trees and they're catching their prey on the move. So they have this enlarged binocularity and, and they also have a large blind spot, um, which enables them to pick up their prey very quickly at the slightest movement. Something that has really blown my mind with, with scavengers in particular is the way they interact in the landscape. I've spoken about how they can pick up prey, but they really do rely on the interactions and small triggers or cues that they give when they're foraging. And often a vulture starts circling when they've spotted their prey and they drop down onto the onto their, their carcass or the carrion that they're feeding on. And that single motion triggers a, a really interesting kind of cascade event. And vultures often follow other birds that are foraging. And when they see this, this behavior of them feeding, they will follow. And it's, it's believed that they can see this movement from up to five or six kilometers. I believe it's more. Um, and I'll tell you why. But so we've seen birds, a single bird drop down from an empty sky onto a carcass. And we have had from one second an empty sky to a sky full of vultures. And they have this gregarious feeding um, behavior and um, they travel massive distances, as I say. But this, this event on its own is a, is a spectacle of nature to witness. And as I mentioned, we've seen a blue empty sky full with vultures. And we've had two, 300 vultures drop down on a carcass and clean that carcass up in a matter of minutes. I mean, uh, something the size of an impala, which is you know up to about 40, 50 kilograms, in nine minutes, they can clean that carcass down to the bone. And that, that for me makes them such extraordinary and important birds in, in the ecosystem. Other kind of morphologies or, or, or adaptations and evolutions of, of, of birds of prey is this remarkable, um, this, the, the design of their eye. And they, they essentially have kind of three parts to their eyes. So a human eye has kind of two parts that move our, our eyelids closed, but our rap, raptors have this nictitating membrane, which closes almost in a horizontal motion. And that protects that eyelid and they even have a bony, um, bony structure around the eye to protect the eye. And that's really important when they're taking on, you know, some of the more formidable prey items. But also, if you think about vultures, when they're scrumming on a carcass and they, they are, are getting in there and there's, te there's beaks and sharp claws and they really need to protect those eyes. So a really cool adaptation. Um, another element or, or feature of, of raptors that is, of course, that we're more kind of familiar with is, is, their, is their talons and their claws. And you can see there's a, a really incredible diversity in the designs that these raptors have in their, in their claws. And this enables them to perform different roles in, their, in, in, their, in the ecosystem and in terms of their hunting and their, their, their feeding um, behavior. So there's this beautiful diversity of raptor claws that enables them to, to really perform their role effectively. Um, so effective, yeah, their teeth, their, their claws, and also they have these, these large talons, um, largely have these large talons at the end of their feet. Um, and this is kind of a, defi a defining feature of birds of prey, and it plays a crucial role in their predatory lifestyle. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the birds that we work on and the kind of claws that we deal with on a day-to-day on -day basis when we're catching these birds and we're conducting research on them. Um, but as I say, it, it enables them to do a variety of tasks in their, in their, in their daily lives, um, from catching prey, building nests, which I think is quite an overlooked thing, but they, they build these really elaborate nesting structures, um, especially with the larger eagles, and they carry these large, um, these large sticks and stuff to build their nests and their, their nesting platforms. 
Um, and, and especially when, when you're looking at your aerial birds that are your, 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 your peregrines and your falcons, they are performing these really highly um, sophisticated coordinated tasks in the air, um, which is really remarkable. Um, so yeah, in Africa, yeah, we have a suite of beautiful eagle species. Um, I've been really fortunate enough to work on martial eagles and crown eagles, and these birds have a formidable set of, of talons. Um, and you can see in the picture in the middle here, I'm holding a martial eagle. Um, and you can just see that the pure size of that, th those talons, and those are just there to effectively, obviously, catch their prey and, um, and kill their prey. And they drive those talons in almost like daggers. Um, so, yeah, you, they demand a lot of respect working on these birds. Um, and we we often we've, you know we've been told and warned about you know keeping your 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 eye out for those those talons. We often actually wrap them up when we're working on them, uh, especially with more feisty birds. Eagles in general are quite timid and 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 docile when you when you handle them. Crown eagles you you can certainly tell. So that, that's the crown eagle on the right hand side. They're absolutely stunning bird with these these huge claws and talons that they use to to take out. Uh, quite large prey up to the size of bushbuck and monkeys. Um, and, you know, these, these, these animals have the crushing force in their talons equivalent to the crushing force of a lion's jaw. So you can just imagine, um, you know, that, that crushing force and you've, you've got to be extremely careful when working on these birds. Um, another set of birds that we are really fortunate to work on are our owl species here. Um, we do a lot of work on African grass owls. You can just see how well adapted they are to catching their rodent prey. Grass owls love flay rats, um, otomus species. And um, you can just see what, what, what kind of equipment they have to catch those. They're grappling hooks there. And for me, one of the coolest birds out there is a Powell's fishing owl. I mean, these birds, you can see these are some of the chicks we work on on the Blyder River up in the Low Felt, uh, which is in the eastern side of South Africa. And effectively those are like grappling hooks and that's used to catch fish so an owl that catches fish just for me blows my mind and they're such cool species to work on um and all owls are just are, are incredible birds you know they they have such a diversity of, of prey that they, they 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 feed on and their diet is really kind of diverse and they just have this equipment to help, you know enable them to catch these species um these prey items um, moving over to vultures, it's, it's, it's also quite an interesting evolutionary process, but vultures obviously have moved away from using their feet, although I must admit, don't ever get your, your, your fingers or hands caught in a talon because they grip and they do have an incredible crushing force, um, and we've learned that the hard way, but their feet are more designed for obviously landing and walking, and they obviously use their beaks a lot more to to consume their prey. So they don't. They've almost lost their ability to crush and catch um, food with their with their talons. Um, interestingly enough, I say that, and I've pulled out this particular bird because it's also one of my favourite vultures, also one of our most threatened vultures in Africa, the white-headed vulture. This is a youngster, um, and they are one of the only vultures known to actually catch prey. Um, so these birds act actively pursue and hunt prey, and they they be known to take things like mongooses and um, and squirrels and even something like a guinea fowl. So they they quite extraordinary birds. So they scavenge and they hunt, um, and one of the coolest birds out there. And the coloration is also just phenomenal. So then moving on from talons, um, we've got to speak about beaks. So raptor beaks or bills are another essential adaptation that obviously distinguishes them um, from the other avian groups. And these beaks are well suited for their predatory lifestyle and they play a really critical role in catching, tearing and consuming their prey. Um, and they're generally quite sharp and strong and they're obviously characterized by a hook in, in the beak. And um, that also allow, uh, allows them to also dismiss their prey. A lot of the falcons actually are, are well suited to giving a very clean uh, bite. And that obviously helps them take down uh, their, their avian prey, uh, which, is, which is obviously one of their, their larger uh, diet items. Um, so vultures, on the other hand, as I mentioned, have, they have beaks that are more specialized for scavenging. And what's really phenomenal is working on these birds is actually holding them in your hand and seeing these different beak designs and how they actually enable them to consume different parts of a carcass. So things like a hooded vulture have a long slender beak and they often hang back while the white back vultures and your, your lappet face vultures with these big beaks tear apart the carcasses 
you know, feeding on the organs and the flesh. And then the hoodies move in and they start eating on the smaller bits of sinew and tendons. And, and that's kind of what really makes them tick. So a real massive diversity in beak designs. Um, something that I don't really think about too often is tongues and taste. Um, and raptors have a really unique um, set of, of tongue shapes and designs. And, uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of work done on, on taste in other species. And there certainly is an element of taste, but largely raptors have, are believed to have a lesser amount of, of or lesser capability of tasting. Um, although there's, you know, there's a lot of research lacking in that department, but their tongue has a really important function. And I'd like to, you know, look towards vultures in particular, um, have a look at that remarkable tongue and those, those, the rasping tongue and that design, they have these hooks almost like teeth on their tongue. And what's really fantastic is that it enables them to obviously consume large amounts of flesh in a single go and they just gulp down food. We've seen birds take so much food into their crops that they can barely take off. And it's all because of that tongue and that beak working, working in kind of con conjunction or in concert. So really remarkable birds. And then looking at the size, I mean, just in terms of the African species, we have this remarkable diversity in, in size um, from some of our heaviest birds, like your Cape vultures, moving across the spectrum through your eagles, your hawks, your falcons, your, your, your hawks, etc., down to your little falcons. As I say, one of the most remarkable little birds is a pygmy falcon, you know, at the end spectrum of, of size in terms of, of, of raptor body size. Um, and just comparing them to one of our larger, heavier um, raptors in, in Africa, your Cape vultures, which weigh about eight, eight and a half kilograms with a really incredible wingspan and size. You've got your little pygmy falcon, which are also really formidable hunters taking down anything from insects all the way through to small mammals and reptiles. So they, they're really cool little species. This is a bird that we were working on with the, with the University of Cape Town, and we caught this little bird in in the Kalahari district of South Africa. And this just gives you kind of an idea of how small these little birds are and how, how, how incredibly they suited they are to their, their, their lifestyle and catching smaller prey items. But really fantastic little birds. I, I've got quite a, a lot of enjoyment out of working with them and, and just seeing them in the wild. Another interesting feature of, of raptors is generally you have sexual size dimorphism, differences in, in sizes between the sexes in raptors. Often the female is, is substantially larger than the male. And this opens up all sorts of questions as to what the, you know, what the, the, the evolutionary adaptation is around that. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to actually work on this a little bit in, in the species that I did my PhD on, black sparrowhawks. And just looking at that sexual size dimorphism, so having smaller males and females, it almost opens up a new window in terms of their foraging niche. The males were catching more were more specialized in catching smaller prey items, your birds, um, whereas the females were bringing in bigger prey items, guinea fowls and either, even things like squirrels, although those, those, those were a little like little fewer fewer or a lower percentage of those in their in their in their diet. But just looking at the sexual you know size dimorphism is, is a really interesting feature of raptors. And you know the females also invest a lot of time into developing eggs and laying eggs and protecting the nest. And it's a really remarkable feature of raptors. Some of the differences are a little bit harder to pick apart. Um, we've seen species like marshall eagles where the, the, the size difference isn't as no, noticeable or, you know, in general, we do pick it up, especially with the talons. Females have these big talons and, and big thick legs that you, you can feel when you're holding them. Um, but, you know, you also have kind of big males and small females. So there is a little bit of you know, less disparity between between the sexes, a bit harder to pick up between the two. And then, of course, flight, um, which which makes raptors really a remarkable feature or characteristic of the African landscape. I mean, looking up into the sky and seeing a bird sail across the sky is just something that really, you know, makes makes my heart pump. And it, it really brings me a lot of enjoyment working in the bush and seeing a sky full of raptors. And they really are, you know, true masters of the sky and um you know raptor flight is a marvel of grace and power and precision and these birds of prey are, are exceptional flyers and they possess really remarkable adaptations that enable them to excel in aerial pursuits and and looking at wing design is just it, it it's mind-blowing um how the various wing designs have enabled them to take on different 
behaviors and to take on different preys. I mean, you think about a, a, a falcon that's designed for speed. They have these long wings that can fold away and they almost become like a, a teardrop or a bullet in the sky. And then, you know, compared to something like a vulture that have these big broad wings that enable them to thermal and catch, um, catch, you know, wind and, and, and slope saw and, and use that, that wind to their advantage. If you've ever seen vultures moving across a landscape, they're barely flat. Um, they can they can travel for hundreds of kilometers and and just ride thermals, so they really do interact with the landscape. And if if any of you are, are passionate raptor, um, you know, twitches, I guess, um, you you always pick a cliffside or a, or a slope, and you'll often see raptors utilizing that slope um, to to obviously gain height and travel and traverse large landscapes and and hunt. And hunt. I hope this video works. Um, this is a GPS track vault, uh, GPS track Varose eagle in the Karoo of um, Central South Africa. And this animation shows you how this bird interacts with the landscape. And um, GPS tracking has opened all sorts of new doors in terms of how we understand how raptors interact with the landscape and how they use these thermals to hunt and to, to travel and traverse across the landscape. But you can just see how this bird is using thermals to gain elevation, and then once it gets to a certain point, then it can travel down to a perch or to a hunt you know, to to hunt um, and take on prey. And they, as I say, they can spot prey from five, six kilometers away. So a really extraordinary adaptation that has made these birds so successful across all sorts of environments. Um, I picked up this this little bit of information in terms of how birds actually how high they fly, and I couldn't believe when um, I, I pulled out this bit of uh, information around a repulse vulture that was hit by a jet um, over the Ivory Coast at an altitude of 11,000 meters, so 11 kilometers above ground level, this bird was soaring. And you can just imagine the view from, from up there and how they can you know, take advantage of, of that height to spot their prey across a, a, vast, a vast landscape. Um, another really important feature to touch on is how these birds move and and how they time their movements with conditions and, and and favorable conditions and how they often follow things like rainfall on the right hand side is uh warburg's uh, warburg's eagle which is a intra-african migrant and these amazing little eagles undertake a massive migration each year uh, they they travel from south africa where we actually tag this pair um so we, we tagged a, a male and a female from the same territory and each year they take this incredible journey, 15,000 kilometers north up to Chad, where they overwinter and they follow the rain and follow their food. So it's a really remarkable feature for, for raptors. And it's not only the Warburgs, a whole variety of raptors actually, of, they, they migrate, um, some between continents, which I'll touch on in the next slide. Um, so we have wanderers and we also have birds that are territory holders and they, they think species like marsh eagles hold territories and they, they defend those territories to the death. And we've often seen birds actually encounter each other in, in a territory and actually kill each other. So they have small home ranges, things like uh, crowned eagles and, and your forest species also tend to have smaller home ranges, obviously where there's a bit more prey and they can rely on a prey base that obviously lasts throughout the year. Um, so a really interesting feature. For me, that also another phenomenal or extraordinary feature of raptors and often in your smaller species are these migrations that take them between continents. And we work, uh, we're for fortunate enough to work on these, these amazing little raptors, uh, the Amur falcons, lesser kestrels and red-footed falcons. And each year we see them arrive in summer in massive numbers. And some of these birds are coming as far as, far as India and Europe. And um, they're making their way down to over, over spend the summer um, when there's a lot of food and, and a nice prey base for them in South Africa. And we spend a lot of time counting these roosts and monitoring um, each year whether these roosts are, are, are staying stable or whether the, the birds are declining. And it's a really kind of important kind of barometer to understand how these birds are, are doing and the status of these birds. But these beautiful, huge, um, uh, these huge roosts that we pick up. Yeah, and then of course, feathers, which enable these birds to to obviously fly and these these feathers are a marvel of engineering and they obviously essential for remarkable flight capabilities um, they're uniquely adapted to suit the needs of these predatory birds and feathers are often very strong and lightweight and 
in, in some cases, or have very complex structures that contribute to their, their aerodynamics and their, their hunting skills. Um, so feathers, yeah, they, they're really important in a raptor. They provide stability and then obviously enable them to, to undertake their, their various um, behaviors. Um, and the primary feathers at the tips of the wings, you can often see they are uh, a little bit darker. And these are obviously, these often have a lot more kind of darker pigments, which harden them and enable them to be a bit more rigid. And these are really important for lift. Um, and the secondary feathers, which you see closer to the body of the bird, are really important in, in controlling flight. And then they use that in conjunction with their tails to help them to move and, and um, obviously hunt, etc. So I've actually lifted, I've put this particular slide in because vultures for me, have, it's always been really interesting um, how these birds fit, you know, they, fit, they have feathers and they often scrumming and putting their feathers really to the test. And often when you catch a vulture and you look at those feathers, they, they, they have, a lot of wear and tear them. You can imagine what they're actually putting through them, put, putting their feathers through. So um, these feathers are often hardened and have a lot of pigment in them to, to harden them and keep them rigid so that they can, you know, be put through these, these really kind of rough and tumble situations. Um, and then looking at feather design, uh, we have to mention owls, and it's really important to, or extraordinary to note that owls, for those of you that, are, that don't know, have, um, silent flight which for me is really fascinating they they're hunting really aware sensitive prey that pick you know pick up the slightest of sounds so they really are finely tuned their feathers are finely tuned to facilitate silent flight um, and they have these specialized feathers that have really unique features that set them apart from other raptors and if you look at the leading edges of our wing feathers they possess a serrated structure and this reduces the aerodynamic noise during flight and that allows them to get closer to their prey um, a really extraordinary feature of the owls. Um, and owls also possess really good hearing capabilities, and that really sets them apart from, um, you know, other species. And their auditory adaptations allow them to locate and capture prey. Even when it's too dark, they often use their hearing more, more than their eyesight to pick up their prey. So such a cool bird um, and really, really interesting. And all these features combined obviously enable these birds to hunt in different ways. Um, and they, as I keep on saying, they fill all these ecological niches and they have such a massive prey base from insects all the way through to antelope. Um, and they have different kind of flight styles and looking at the speed of a peregrine falcon, you know, the fastest bird on the, the fastest animal on the planet, um, they're able to get up to 300 kilometers an hour and to see peregrines come down and hit, um, hit, a, hit a, their prey in the sky is just an explosion of feathers. And that's really kind of showcasing how fast these birds travel. Um, so I won't touch too much on, on diet, but, it, you, you know, as I mentioned, they, they really have a massive diversity in the prey that they're able to take. The crowned eagles, um, as I mentioned, have these massive crushing, this massive crushing force in their, in their talons, and they're able to take things the size of monkeys and, and small antelope, really extraordinary species. And then I'm not sure if any of you, any of you have had the luxury of watching um, secretary birds hunt, but they have these long, heavily scaled feet and they are able to take on venomous stakes and they have such a precise, precise blow when, they, when they're using their feet that they, they kill their snake, their prey pretty, pretty instantly and they, they're able to take down these, these highly venomous snakes often. Um, and then for me, of course, I'm a little bit... Um, bias because we work a lot on Powell's fishing owls, but they have this ex extraordinary set of features that enable them to hunt at night, first of all, and catch fish. I mean, how mind-blowing is that? Um, they'll often perch above a still pool and they'll wait until fish come to the surface and they just drop down and we've seen Powell's fishing owl completely submerge themselves, almost drowning themselves in an attempt to grab their prey and then almost swimming to the bank where they drag their prey up and feed on their prey. So remarkable features that have made them such successful river, um, you know, river adapted and aquatic species. So it's just remarkable how they fill that niche. Um, the last thing I want to touch on is, is looking at the nesting, the different nesting behaviors in, in, in species in, across Africa. And I'm going to use the species we particularly work on. Um, and, you know, they have a, also a diversity in their nesting behavior. Often, you know, different species use different 
um, nesting strategies that that make them a little bit more successful in in, this, in a certain set of environmental conditions that they're under. Um, often birds like pulse fishing will take advantage of cavities and they lay their egg in a really crudely made nest. I'm not sure you can see, but often pulse fishing owls, I, I, I think they get a little bit bored, but they almost pull away at the bark and um, they kind of line their nest with the bark in these, in these cavities in their nests. Um, then we have a variety of birds that obviously nest in trees. It's the higher you are, the safer you are from, from all your terrestrial or, or, or ground-based predators. And they build these really elaborate nesting structures where they're safe and they keep their, their chicks safe. Um, we also work on African grass owls, and this is a species that nests on the ground, and you would think that's a really bad adaptation or evolutionary strategy. But these birds build these really elaborate nesting chambers in, in thick grass. I mean, you cannot see them. Um, and, and often it's in such thick patches of grass, um, and, and the extent of their grass is, is almost, you, you can't walk through there, and they nest in the middle of these grass patches. And you can imagine that keeps the nest safe from any predators that are, are, are moving around in that landscape. And then you get birds that also utilize things, you know, other species nests. So uh, your pygmy falcons, which are also really are such a cool species, they build their nests inside of sociable weaver nests. So they also take advantage and usurp nests um, and they raise their young in there. And then things like martial eagles just build these massive nesting structures. We, we often climb up the nest to ring the chicks or put cameras up. And these nests are, are certainly big enough to, to actually lie down on, on the nest. They're such big structures. This is a nest um, that we monitor in the central Karoo. It's built on top of an electrical pylon. You can see the chick in the, um, on the right-hand side of the, the nest, a tiny chick that's probably two days old. But look at the size of that, and there's a bit of prey left there for the chick that the mother will feed to the chick. And raptors have a really, you know, um, they, they put a lot of resources and energy into raising their chicks. And often this has led to species like martial eagles. They invest so much time and resources into raising their chicks that they only lay one egg and they actually only breed every second year because they invest so much time into raising this chick, teaching it how to hunt and how to become an eagle or how to become a raptor. Um, and, and it's really remarkable how much these birds will defend their nest. This is a, a beautiful female black sparrowhawk that I, I worked on in, in my PhD years. And she was the most remarkable bird when you climbed up to the nest, she would stay on the nest with her chicks and to, we would actually have to grab the chicks from under her wing and take them down and she would just sit there with this really um, incredible, you know, grin on her face, well I wouldn't say grin, um, look on her face, a really angry look on her face, but you know, and absolutely looking after her chicks um, like, like no other species out there. So yeah, as I mentioned, all these features and these adaptations have enabled raptors to take on the world. And if you look across all the habitat gradients from deserts to coast to forest, you get raptors. And they're such critical parts of the ecosystem. They fulfill all these important niches um, across the landscape. And in Africa, we've got such a unique and beautiful diversity of raptors that we can work on. And unfortunately, they are also one of the most threatened species on the planet, as I mentioned, the most threatened groups of, of birds. And a lot of their behavioral traits um, make them slightly more vulnerable to, to threats that are out there in the landscape. But, you know, it's really important to finish off this presentation by talking about how important raptors are to the ecosystem. They play such an important ecosystem service as apex predators. They're also important flagships for the status of a, of, a, of a habitat. And we often use them as flagship for the conservation of habitats. Um, we've got a remarkable diversity of raptors that we use as these really flagstone or, or flagship species for the protection of these habitats. Um, and I've really loved working on, on these particular birds, um, using them as barometers for, for the health and for the, the, you know, the conservation of these landscapes. And I have to talk about our vultures because they perform such an important ecosystem service and um, that you remove them from the landscape, we will immediately feel the impacts of these birds. They remove carcasses, they remove disease from the landscape, and they play a really important role. And they're now sitting on a precarious conservation status. So we really need to look after our birds and apply all the energy and resources we can to protecting these beautiful birds. Thank you, guys. But uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, 
And if you do want to contact me, there are my credentials. Um, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure talking about uh, species that make me really tick and I'm so passionate about. Um, and thank you for having me. I hope if all the visuals were fine, I, I don't know if you even can see me. <laughs> A uh, fantastic talk, uh, Gareth. That was um, phenomenal to see. Uh, you can definitely see the passion, which is which is always inspirational. Uh, as a as a fellow raptor biologist, um, your work has been something that I've I've looked up to for a while. So thank you so much for taking the time uh, to come and chat to us about these amazing amazing raptors. And I love the way you uh, you describe them: precision, grace, and power. I couldn't have said it better, right? It's uh, it's from they they are really phenomenal uh, creatures. Uh, we are. I know we are definitely going to get tons of questions. The questions are actually flowing in as we speak. So um, before we get to the questions, I want to just let everybody know part of the series as an education series is where we've actually sent out um, a a poster to uh, everybody that has registered for uh, for tonight's talk. Um, what we'd like you to do is we want to use or, or harness the power of social media. So please, please, guys, open those posters. Those posters are for you guys to use um, and share with everyone you can um, and just get it out there. Send them, send it out on, on, on your social media accounts, share it with colleagues, uh, students, um, for, for students that have friends that haven't attended, please share it with them, um, as well. You, every week, uh, when you register for one of our talks, so every Wednesday night, as I said, seven o'clock, we're going to have a new speaker coming on board and you'll get a new poster, uh, information poster on a different aspect of raptors, uh, raptors and raptors, raptor conservation. So uh, yes, go go onto your way, onto your emails and get those posters and and start sharing them. Um, cool. Moving on to the questions. So I think let's get started with the questions uh, right away. Uh, one of the first questions we had for you, Gareth, was from Nonkululeko. Makubang, I hope I said that correctly. Um, she said, in a talk we once joined one Thursday evening on vultures with Dr. Kendall, we learned that the vultures have powerful acids in their gut that completely digests decaying flesh. And that's how they don't get sick. Is this the case for all raptors um, that are scavengers? That's a great question. Um... So, so vultures have uh, particularly in higher acidity uh, levels in their stomachs. Um, obviously, that's designed to, to break down their, their prey or break down the, 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 the food that they eat. Um, but it's a lot more elevated in, in the vulture's gut. Um, and this, you know, what's really important to mention, doesn't only enable them to break down bone and, and meat and, and organs, but they also break down bacteria. And um, this is why we say they play such an important role in reducing the spread and risk of disease. So they're actually stopping that disease in their track. So if that animal died from uh, something from a disease, those birds clean that carcass up in nine minutes or so if, if there's a big enough group of them and they stop that, that disease in their tracks. So that's why they have, you know, because of their, their particular diet, they have a lot higher um, acidic levels in their stomachs. Um, compared to other species. Um, you know, if you look at something like a bearded vulture that feeds predominantly on, on bones, they have an even higher uh, pH in their, in their or, or should I say lower pH. So I'm trying to look, think back on my chemistry class, but um, you know, they have a lot higher acid, acidity levels in their, in their gut um, compared to things like your, your marsh eagles, et cetera, that can actually digest their food a lot slower and don't need that acidity in their stomachs. Awesome. Awesome. All right. The next question we had is from Bo uh, Boaz Lawyer. Uh, what has been done in the use of technology for raptor conservation, especially endangered species, if possible to get on ground practices? Also a really cool question. And, and it, it ticks all my passions because I, I do a lot of work using technology to complement our conservation and we, we use a, a plethora of, of technology to, as I say, 
help us improve our conservation of, of these remarkable species. Uh, GPS tracking, for one, has opened up a completely new window on how we understand these birds and how they interact with the landscape and the threats they encounter in the landscape. And, you know, it's allowed us to monitor these birds in almost near real time. We can tell down to a few minutes when a vulture has died or fed on a poison in the landscape, and that enables us to follow up on them. So technology has been amazing. Camera traps have also been really a useful tool to monitor breeding um, and understand why birds might be failing their breeding, uh, you know, their breeding process. So we can see what was predating on them, um, what kind of features or, or, or elements might have, uh, you know, driven that that particular uh, failure uh, in a, in their breeding attempt. So technology has, has been mind blowing. Um, but I must say, upfront is is tracking technology. It's opening up new doors for how we understand and conserve these birds. Excellent, excellent. Okay, cool. Thanks, Gareth. Let's take some live questions. Neil Wilson, please ask your question. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting, very interesting talk, Gareth. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me, uh, Kaylin? Yes. Okay, uh, Gareth, uh, Gareth uh, I've been following a crowned eagle um, since September last year, after soon after it was born. Uh, it was ringed by Shane, who's part of this uh, rapt on your raptor panel. And um, he, I've been hearing him daily and the parents and so on uh, in his natal territory. And um, since the 20th of July uh, last week, uh, there was nothing, nothing to be heard. Now, from the literature, I understand that 10 or 11 months uh, the parents will stop feeding the young crowned eagle. But what I would like to know is that is is there any evidence for pa parental tuition in hunting uh, in the crowned eagle specifically and more generally in raptors? So pa parental tuition, are you, are you, uh, there's a bit of a delay. Um... I don't know uh, if you're still yeah. talking. Yes, uh, I just want to know whether crowned eagle parents will teach their young to hunt uh, or will they just, when that 10, 11 month period comes to an end, will they just leave the youngster uh, to his own devices to, to learn by chance how to hunt and whether that applies to crown, uh, crowned eagles and more generally to raptors, whether parents teach they're young to hunt. Yeah, thanks, Neil. That's a that's a great question. Um, so so, what's really interesting is in different species of raptors, you have um, different kind of uh, different kind of timelines in terms of how how the and investments that the parents put into to raising their chicks and in the eagles in particular, as I mentioned with the marsh eagles, they invest a lot of time in in teaching their the young how to hunt. And these these bird, these youngsters, once they fledge, they almost shadow their parents and they learn how to hunt. And they they often um, they, there's a lot of failure, you know, in the process. Um, but there is certainly a time when those birds have invested enough energy and resources into the into the youngsters where they actually start becoming quite aggressive towards the youngsters. And sometimes I've actually seen it the other way around, where youngsters become so aggressive that the adults avoid them um, throughout. Um, and it, it, at that kind of stage, that, that aggression and that interaction between the adults starts driving them apart. Um, and you also start seeing, you know, the adults, as, as it is with a lot of species, start driving the youngsters out of the territory. Um, so I wouldn't say there's a, a definite cutoff. I've also seen really extraordinary overlaps. We have actually seen things like crowned eagles and marsh eagles with a new chick on the nest and the youngster, the youngster from the previous year is still arriving on the nest and being fed. Um, and, and in most cases, they don't tolerate it. But um, as I mentioned, there's a very big diversity in how much time and the kind of level of investment they put into the youngsters. Owls, for instance, spend a lot, a lot less time training the youngsters. They, they, they are incredible birds. I mean, lots of owls that have been rescued as chicks can be released after they've been raised. Um, and they learn they learn how to hunt on their own. So 
there's a, a lot of difference. And I think it's all to do with the prey base. And um, when it comes to more challenging prey, like these, what these eagles are taking down, they need to be taught how to catch those, those species and, and see how the parents do it. Um, they, they certainly won't make it without that training phase of their life. I hope Thank that answers you. your question. Thanks. Cool. Uh, thanks, Gareth. Okay, I see uh, Lewin's actually sent through the question that she was uh, they were they were trying to ask uh, live, um, and that is, it's what it's known that traditional healers are the cause of the decline in the number of vultures due to their cultural beliefs and uses of parts of the vulture in the muti trade. Is this something you have come across in your uh, in your field of work? Absolutely. Um, there, there are a lot of drivers behind vulture poisoning, and 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 for those of you that don't know, poisoning is the is the the major threat driving declines to vultures. It it, it accounts for over ninety five percent of vulture mortalities. If you look at it across the last twenty years, ninety five plus percent has been um, due to poisoning. Um, they poison for various reasons um, that that it would take me most of the night to to unpack. The traditional, um, the traditional harvesting of vulture body parts for traditional medicine is a big driver behind um, the poisoning of vultures and is contributing to their, their decline. Um, in KwaZulu-Natal, we have a big demand for vulture body parts, for instance. Um, lots of the eastern parts of the country, there is a demand for vulture body parts. Um, and we've, we've linked that to local extinctions and species of, of vulture. We've lost white-headed vultures in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, we no longer have any more um, active breeding pairs in in, in northern Zululand. Um, so they, they and that's fundamentally been driven or effectively been driven largely by tr the, the traditional harvesting of their body parts and poisoning of of vultures. It's a it's a really malicious. Um, I don't know. Yeah, there's lots of horrible words I can put in there, but poisoning is it's it's a. Uh, it, it's it's non-selective. Many other species die, and vultures die in big numbers at poisoning scenes. All right, thanks, uh, thanks, Gareth. Uh, let's take another live question here from uh, Brian Otigo. I think that is. If you can unmute yourself, that'll be great. Hi, thank you so much. Yes, it is Otigo. Otigo. But you did good, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. So uh, my question would be on uh, something that I observed when I was doing some uh, nest survey for vultures. In some of the nest, I found uh, active beehives hanging under the nest. So then um, I got worried and maybe uh, asking myself questions that could this be one of the threats to these birds when they have the bees hanging under their nest? Because I was thinking that maybe during the breeding uh, seasons, then these bees could be interfering with the birds in the nest. So could it be one of those threats that are emerging or is it been something that they have been coexisting uh, for the longest time? And uh, uh, on top of that, maybe you just have to ask this all questions at once. Uh, when we then we have uh, poisoning as a threat, and then um, electrocution. So then, uh, which one uh, dominates in Africa context? Is it the poisoning or collision with the energy infrastructures where we have electrocution, and then? Uh, energy, uh, I mean, wind farms. Yeah. So, Brian, was your your first question? Did you say a beehive under the nest? Yes. Yeah, I mean that that that's interesting, and and I, I don't think I can answer that fully. I I've had chickens, um, and I've seen chickens of ours rile up a bee beehive, and the bees have actually killed the the chickens. Um, and I'm not sure if you saw in the news this year, some no, when was it last year, where bees actually killed a whole bunch of African penguins at in Boulders Beach in the Cape Peninsula. So they certainly, once aggravated, have the potential to kill to kill um, you know a, a large bird. So 
unless, you know, unless we really get the evidence of of and, and find the bird with all its all the stings in it, I don't know if we can really link the two. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of eagle nests with beehives in the in 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 the cavities and the holes below the nest. And we've we found that out that the hard way by climbing up the nest and then, you know, obviously aggravating the bees and having to descend 20 meters down, hot footing it to get away from bees. But it certainly might be might be something there. I, yeah, I, I don't know if um, if the birds would trigger or aggravate the bees enough, but it, it certainly could be one of the the it could contribute to if there was a breeding failure. Um, it's not impossible. Um, and then in terms of your question around poisoning versus, you know, electrocutions and collisions with energy infrastructure, um, they, 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 they certainly are more kind of predominant in, in, in various areas in, in, in Africa. Um, electrical infrastructure is a huge concern and, a, and, and lots of birds are killed each year on, on energy infrastructure. Uh, a, a emerging threat is birds that collide with wind turbines and wind farms. Your larger body raptors like your Cape vultures and your marsh eagles and your Faroese eagles are being killed quite a lot on wind farms and it is something we're trying to address. Uh, power lines are a huge issue. Um, you can ask uh, our friends from Valpro. They collect hundreds of birds a year. Um, and those are the ones that actually survive the collisions or the electrocutions on power lines. But uh, in some, some years, we have over a thousand you know, fatalities on energy infrastructure. Um, so it's a big, big concern. And it obviously complements the poisoning aspect. But as a whole, as I mentioned, if you put all the threats together, poisoning is the biggest threat to African vultures. Yeah, definitely something um, that's very concerning eh? um, across the across the board. Uh, Emlyn Costa, you've been waiting for quite patiently. I think uh, go for it. Ask your question. Thank you very much. Um, I'm curious, it, it builds on the last couple of answers where there was a focus on unnatural causes of raptor death, but all the beautiful pictures of birth and flight and capture and, uh, and their life raises in me the question of what are the natural causes of death of raptors? Do they, do they die of old age? Do they, do they have accidents in predation like other animals where they're, they're less effective at completing the kill. I'm, I'm curious, sorry for the morose question, but all the beautiful pictures of their life make me curious about their death. Yeah, it, it's a, it's quite a, it, uh, an interesting question. So, you know, generally raptors, and I'm, I'm talking of all sizes, are, are quite long-lived species. And we find that if they can survive that kind of first phase of, of, of you know, going going through the, the development into becoming an adult, um, that's kind of the, the, where they are, have the highest risk of dying. Um, and, and they have, a you know, as I mentioned, most of their, their current threats or their, their causes of death are anthropogenic, uh, so human, human caused. But there certainly are um, a lot of cases where birds die naturally, um, uh, you know, whether it's starvation, um, predation, you know, uh, there's there's a big element of of predation in in um, a variety of your, your your raptor species. As I mentioned, there's also a lot of kind of territorial aggression between raptors. They they they're incredibly aggressive and they kill each other. So there are other things that are killing them naturally, um, but 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 they they kind of don't line up to the kind of rate of of risk and and mortalities that are linked with the human side of things, uh, or the human driven causes of death. Um, yeah, so so there are you know there are more natural um, causes of death, and um, we don't really focus on those because they they they're natural. Um, we've seen things like leopards eat vultures. I mean, leopards go up a up a up a, eat, up a vulture nest, and and that's a that's a natural event. Um, you know, there's 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 a lot of kind of natural drivers also um, that 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 are interesting, but we don't really focus on them um, unfortunately. But really no, can I just supplement by, I mean, before, other than anthropogenic causes, obviously in the, in the life cycle, they, they must, you know, and without humans um, before us, they must have died naturally for all sorts of causes. And you've just cited, you know, um, predators going up to nest, but I'm, I'm curious whether once they do die, 
from natural causes or old age or predation accidents? Are they quickly removed from the landscape because they in turn become the food for other meat eating um, raptors and other animals? So you really never encounter them in all your photographs. I mean, the photographs capture every other stage of life, but have you encountered you know, a raptor lying on the ground? Yeah, I mean, they, 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 we could we could probably talk about peculiar cases of, of natural deaths that that we've 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 never really got to the bottom of. I mean, we've had birds blown off nests um, in bad storms, and um, you know, we often get to to nests that we're monitoring, and the chicks completely gone. And that's why I, I also mentioned camera traps have been really important in understanding. Um, what what the predators are of, of of these of these birds? Um, we've seen things like baboons also, you know, predating on the eggs. Um, so I would, would certainly say that um, we, we generally see the older a bird gets, and and once they reach adulthood, their their probability of survival is a lot higher, um, and and they do get to live these long lives. Um, you know, if 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 it's in a natural kind of setup, but. Um, yeah, we've had a lot of unexplained deaths uh, where we find a raptor on the ground under the nest and you just can't really unpack what that was. Um, but yeah, when there are cases of predation um, and we, you know, when you're working on birds in Kruger National Park, for instance, they are scavenged. So you, you just come, come across a pile of feathers. So yeah, it's, um, there certainly is a, a big element of, of natural, uh, natural deaths in, in the species we monitor. Yeah, and you know, I think just adding my two cents from that, uh, from my experience, um, we don't think about the prey that these birds are eating as well. Sometimes prey fights back. Um, we had uh, uh, an incident once where a a snake eagle was actually envenomated in the crop by a Mozambican spitting cobra. Um, we only knew that because after while ringing the bird, uh, the snake came out of the crop, and um, yes. So prey does fight fight back sometimes, and you do have peculiar deaths. Um, but we are, as Gareth said, we don't we don't focus on those types of things uh, because we're so uh, preoccupied working on the anthropogenic uh, impacts on the on the species. But yeah, thanks for that uh, that that question, Emlyn. Um, Blaine, I think you've been waiting for quite a while. Let's uh, let's ask your question. <clears throat> Evening. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Um, sorry, I just wanted to ask. So um, I, I, I stay in about Joburg side and we've got quite a large amount of sort of Harrier Hawks and um, yeah, it's basically a lot of the Harrier Hawks in terms of the Raptor side. Um, I just wanted to ask in terms of, uh, how do I ask? Um, so is there any projects that you know of or anything being done to try and reduce the, the effects of like secondary redentory poisoning or sort of the anthropogenic sort of effects on your raptors in your large cities such as Joburg, Pretoria, Cape Town. Um, are you aware of anything that they're, anything trying to be done to try and slow it down or stop it or create awareness? Yeah, we, we used to be quite heavily involved in, in trying to work on secondary poisoning associated with rodenticides. And it, it's, a, it's a huge concern in, in the cities. I mean, um, their, their, their rehab is around the country working in the cities that are collecting, you know, dozens of, of owls every, every week um, that have been poisoned or secondary, it's often secondary poisoning um, by consuming obviously the rodents that have the poisons in them. There's, there, there, there are quite a few active projects working on trying to promote, um, you know, alternative uh, ways to, to control rodents. Um, and and we push hard with all the, the the landowners and partners and stakeholders we work with. We push really hard to to move away from poisons. For me, there is no safe poison out there, and um, you know there, there is. You you can walk into many shops and 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 have uh, uh, basically a rodenticide with the packaging saying that it's owl friendly, etc. I'm not convinced by that. Um, it, you know you wouldn't let your child eat on those poisons or you know it's a bad example but those those rodenticides bioaccumulate as well and and you know we've just seen over and over again cases of of no safe poisons out there 
but you know there are lots of really good rehabbers out there mm -hmm. that are, 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 are really pushing to to remove poisons from the landscape and use different uh, ways to control rodents and in fact one of the best ways to control rodents is to have owls around so um mm -hmm. put an owl box up and and you know barn owls are phenomenal phenomenal rodent hunters and you, you know when they've got a big clutch of chicks they can hunt up to 15 between 15 and 30 rats a, a night um to yeah. keep the owls there don't put poisons out um but yeah we, we definitely need to do more drives around eradicating poisons because there are no safe poisons out there in my mind that's my my opinion yeah, well, I, I do agree. I've done the amount of times you walk into lifestyle or wherever, and there's just it's so readily it's so it is so readily available. Sorry, um, but yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, eh? <laughs> Thanks, Blade. Yeah, all right. Uh, well, well put there, Gareth. No, no owl friendly poison. Let's take another question from is it Ammo or Amor? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Bottom left hand corner. There you go. Um, good evening. So um, I have a question about um, the Marshall Eagles nest. So the Marshall Eagles, they um, build their, ne their nest from um, a head from 20 to, to 80 feet. So what are the chances of the chick surviving after it has fell out of the nest? So yeah, the, we, we've seen many, many cases where, it, and this also depends on the age of the chick, um, the younger the chick is, and if it falls out the nest, the less chances they have of survival. But we've seen many chicks fall out of nests and actually are still successfully raised by the parents. Um, often, you know, they're, they're able to climb high up onto the onto trees or whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, so there, there is still a, a level of chance of survival, and, and and often with birds and birds of prey in particular, if you do find a grounded bird. The best, the best case sometimes is just to leave it alone. The parents will still bring it up. Um, but as I say, if you've got a very young chick, they, they're born very undeveloped um, and they, they, they often also break bones and injure themselves on the fall if, they, if they're tree nesting um, and they, they don't survive that. But yeah, certainly the older they get, the more chance they do they have uh, to survive um, and the parents actually looking after them and feeding them from where they are. Uh, I think we lost Paul Ryder, uh, but either way, uh, Brendan McCarthy, you can ask your question. Unmute yourself and ask ask your question. Evening, chaps. And thanks for the great presentation. Just to, I don't know, I can't seem to hear you guys, but anyway, I'm going to go ahead and then I'll... Um, just mute myself after I've asked a question. Um, I just want to kind of get a bit of a uh, brief overview of what is the sort of uh, criteria uh, that sets different types of raptors apart from each other. I mean, why would one be a, called a hawk or one be called a harrier and one would be called an eagle? Is it, is it body shape? Is it diet? Is it um, the way that they actually predate? Um, can you guys maybe share a little bit of why that is and and how that's classified? Brendan, you just opened up a can of worms. Um, but yeah, you're dead right. Uh, the the general differences in, in in morphology do kind of classify raptors into different categories. Um, and their prey base also often is associated with that that different kind of um design or body design so yeah it's it's a it's a mix of 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 you know their morphology and the the the, the evolutionary uh, tree that that particular raptor developed from um but but it's largely around the the different kind of uh physical features uh for instance if you look at a you know eagles are largely uh, uh they have fully feathered feet um, so there's, there's different traits that 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 put them or separate them from from other species. Yeah. Thanks, Gareth. Uh, I see. 
I think Amo asked his question. Brendan did. Paul, so we got a we got a, a question in the chat from Paul. Um, are we still losing vultures due to poaching? And at what percentage uh, work at a falconry center in UK? And trying to educate the public. Oh, he works at a falconry center in the UK and is trying to educate the public on the plight. And apart from Valpro, are there any other groups working with them? And how can we prompt the plight better to the public? Yeah, um, vultures are in a precarious conservation state. Um, in 2015, most of our African species were uplisted to either critically endangered or endangered. And, um, you know, just to answer that, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a variety of organizations that are working on, on vultures in particular across Africa. Um, one of the biggest, um, I guess, progressions towards conservation of vultures was the development of a multi-species action plan for vultures. This is like the Bible for vulture conservation across 127 range states. So that's including Europe and, and Asia. Um, and what's quite encouraging is that in South Africa and, and many other countries, we each developing our own management and action plan to conserve vultures because of their conservation status. Um, and we're talking globally endangered. If you line these birds up with uh, species like rhino and your more charismatic species, vultures are on a lot more, that they, they're at a higher, much higher risk to extinction. We're losing these birds at unprecedented, unprecedented rates. In Africa, we, we're currently experiencing a, a vulture crisis. Um, and that's led to multiple organizations, you know, consolidating the efforts to protect these birds. Um, the EWT, you know, we, we started about, in fact, it's our 50th anniversary and um, vultures were one of the first species we started working on, um, Cape vultures in particular, which were, were on the brink of extinction. And because of a, a combined effort in South Africa, um, between the EWT and multiple partners, Volpro and BirdLife and a whole bunch of other organizations, um, Wildlife Act, and yeah, I, I, there's many, many, many. Um, you know, we, we, we quite encouraged that, you know, in Cape Vultures, um, a couple of years ago, they were downlisted to, to vulnerable from endangered. And that's because of the efforts that have been applied to these birds. So we're still confident that we can turn around the population trends. But at the moment, we are going through the only way I can explain it is that yeah, is is it's it's hell at the moment. Um, we the poisoning at the moment in in vulture strongholds is 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 actually very concerning. Um, just in this last week, we've lost over two hundred vultures to poisoning in Greater Kruger. So um, it's 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 something that we are all very concerned about. All right, thanks, Gareth. Uh, I think let's take another live question. Uh, Daniel Joubert, unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Uh, evening. Thank you so much for the talk. I appreciate it. My question is, um, with regards to falconry and stuff, uh, people are starting to breed like geofalcons and peregrine falcons together and lana and other sort of falcons together. What is your What effect do you think this will have on our natural populations, if any. Yeah, thanks, Danielle. Um, yeah, th these hybrids are, are, are an interesting kind of, yeah, they're, they're interesting. And, and you know, in, in, in the most part, these birds aren't interacting with our, with our natural or with our, our in-situ populations, um, with our wild populations. And yeah, I think falconry has a really big part to play in conservation. Um, I, I tend to keep clear of of the you know the, the 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 breeding and the hybrids and stuff, but but from what I've seen is most hybrids that do escape, they they don't they don't generally survive and they don't in inbreed with with other or they interbreed with um you know with our local species. Um, yeah, it, yeah, I don't think there's too much more to unpack in that regard. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting you know, movement to, 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 to breed these, you know, these kind of exciting new hybrids. Um, but as I say, I think for the most part, falconers are quite careful with their birds and they got telemetry on them. So 
when they do escape, they they normally are recovered. And um, you know, coming from a, from being you know raised often in a in a captive environment, they don't survive long out there. Um, and you know, in in my experience, I've I've I have not seen in in you know mixing of of gene pools and interbreeding. So yeah, I think that that's that's about it. Um, but I, what one thing I must touch on is I've seen some really incredible work done by falconers, and we rely on them and their facilities to to help us rehabilitate birds um, that are are taken in from the wild that are either injured or or um, found as as nestlings, etc. Um, and they help us improve the fitness of those birds so that we can ensure that when they are released, they are, are, are flying fit. All right. Thanks, Gareth. Uh, Letitia and Pabalo have a similar question. Um, and that is, uh, let me just make sure I get the, uh, what are the major threats to raptors? And in your professional pr uh, perspective, what uh, at what rate would you say that these birds are moving towards um, being extremely endangered, if not extinct? Yeah, so it 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 varies on on varies from species to species. They all have their own suite of of threats and. It's a dynamic landscape out there. As you move from one region to the next, the threats differ. Um, at, you know, as I keep on saying, poisoning is always one that kind of always peaks at the top of of um, of the list in terms of threats. But you know, there's there's also a, a huge concern around habitat loss. I think that's a that's a really big big one for us, and we're seeing habitats shrinking. And these birds rely on intact habitats. And as I keep mentioning, they, you know, birds have the ability to fly. So they, they're going to move from an area that's unsuitable to an area that's suitable when they're losing suitable landscape. So um, what's an interesting kind of outcome of that is birds also becoming, certain species are becoming quite um, uh, urbanized and, and they're doing really well in urbanized environments. But in the most part, loss of habitat is a really big, a really big one. Um, if you look at development and population growth, the the underlying issue here is that there's too many people in too little space. Um, so raptors are losing, you know, the the habitat and conditions they need to thrive, and and we need to conserve massive landscape for. If you think about a vulture that has, you know, a home range of twenty five thousand kilometers, bigger than some 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 home range is bigger than Lesotho, they need huge spaces, um, and that's a conservation challenge on its own. Um, the job that that kind of yeah there, there's a whole suite of threats um out there and, and and most of them are anthropogenic so human driven yeah no well put there um we've got a question from i i don't know if this is the uh, dr ogilvy or one of his students but uh, how will we it's actually quite a touchy touchy question uh how will we overcome traditional beliefs pertaining to raptors uh i knew that was i i figured that's probably going to come from you somewhere along the line um gareth would you like to weigh in on that sure <laughs> very complex um and i don't think we're going to sort it out in the next year uh, i actually had a meeting today that that went in circles because we, we we're trying to we're trying to address um you know cultural beliefs that that go back thousands and thousands of years um and that are kind of blueprinted into into our society um it we 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 need to attack it at at various levels i mean we need to first of all create awareness around the conservation status of of these birds and that it's not a a limit a limitless there's not a limited there's not a limitless supply of, of vultures out there and, and the way we're harvesting them is completely unsustainable um we we got to attack the the problem from various angles we've got to you know look at what the human health um you know safeguarding human health elements are around you know harvesting vultures with poisons you know these poisons are being taken into the muti markets and then eventually being prescribed to to their clients um it, it's a it's a massively tough question and we, we've taken it to the national level in south africa 
and we still don't have answers. A lot of them are centered on awareness and education, um, but it's not enough. Um, we, we, we still don't have the answers to, to addressing it, to be honest. Um, and, it, you know, if you look at the rhino poaching issue, it's, it's a similar kind of scenario where you're not stopping the drivers and the demand. And um, we're just seeing an increase in demand and it's, it's linked to more people and, and uh, a bigger demand for, for these body parts and, and for the muti and, and for, for the, for the uh, I guess, the, what it's prescribed for, which is quite crazy if we had to really unpack that. Yeah, no, it's a difficult one. It's definitely a, a touchy subject. Um, but yeah, well, well, well done there, Gareth. Um, we have just enough time for one more question. And I see Doc, Dr. Ogilvy actually wants to respond. So I think we're going to end it off on that response. Uh, so yeah, Dr. Ogilvy, take, uh, take the floor. Uh, sorry, I'll keep it short. But yes, I've been battling with that for many years down at Induma with the um, cultural beliefs. And even my thesis, my daughter showed that vultures and various birds, um, birds of prey have been used. Um, but I think it's time. And if you guys have got some kind of idea is how are we going to get this into the school curriculum? I know that we say education may not help, but if we start at a very young age, and we start interlinking these crucial aspects and the information into the curriculum from an early age, we should be able to bring about some kind of a change. So, Kaylin, your next thesis. <laughs> Let's get this into the school curriculum, and that's important. It's one of the important topics. Sorry, just a comment, but it was an amazing talk. Thank you. I've been getting messages all night from my students, and Kaylin, your students too. Um, well done. And well done to our guest speaker tonight. It was amazing. Thank you. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Perfect. All right, guys. Uh, I know uh, Gareth is actually sitting at the EWT offices right at the moment. So he's going to have to get going out of there before they lock him in for the night. Um, but thank you all for joining us. Uh, if you have extra questions, please, please, please. Get a hold of Gareth, uh, drop us a message. We, we, we're happy to, to, to reach out or uh, send it through to Gareth as well. Um, and remember to join us from next week, every Wednesday night at seven o'clock. Um, this this uh, Raptor series is going to be carrying on for the next four months, I think it is, until November. So um, lots of Raptor education, lots of unpacking Raptors as a as an amazing group of, of animals, actually. So, uh, and, and some of the speakers, we, we're going to be speaking to some of the um, most well-known and um, also very, very influential uh, raptor specialists and biologists throughout the African continent. Um, it's all about African raptors, all about African specialists. Um, and so we're very excited to share all this with you guys. Please join in with us uh, from next week, Wednesday. again.